we don't have any control over whether or not the agent's going to talk to a seller, which is going to get a deal or talk to a seller and they're going to say yes to our low offer. We don't, we don't have any control over that, but what we do have control over is talking to 15 agents an hour and putting offers and asking them if they have deals like that, that we have control over and that's going to move the needle more than anything else in this business. All right. So welcome, Brian Russo. Really, really excited to do this interview with you because you are a teenager who literally four days ago from this interview graduated high school. And there's not too much impressive about that. But what is impressive is that you've now wholesaled, I believe, $100,000 in assignments. Is that right? Yep. Correct. Pretty close to that. So I think it's at 92 or something like that. 91, 92. But Hundred, yeah, almost, yeah, almost a hundred thousand as a high schooler and a teenager. So this is just fascinating. You're a huge inspiration. I know I sh- I shared your story a bit with uh, my kids. I've got some teenagers, and they're super impressed, and they want to meet you and and learn from you. And it's really incredible to see how many younger people are getting into this business and learning and figure figuring it out and being successful. I mean, like you made more money you know, then your, then your school teachers did. And right. So yeah. <laughs> it's really impressive. And so we're yeah. going to talk all about that. So again, welcome. Thank you for doing this interview with me. You're also good friends and you've done a lot of business with Jared Hetler in Virginia, uh, in Vir- Virginia beach area. And so, and I love Jared. I've had him on the channel, I think two or three different times doing interviews. Great, great guy. I know you and him are really good friends and and doing deals together. So that's exciting. And that's yep. how I met you through Jared. So, mm-hmm. so Sweet. Brian, thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. It was an awesome opportunity. Yeah, me and Jared are best buddies. He's he's taught me everything, and he's he's been learning from you. So, in a way, I've been learning from you this whole time. It's I love it. I I can't be thankful enough. But yeah, appreciate you having me. That's cool. So, tell us a little bit about how you got started and what drew you to wholesaling. And maybe we'll start from there. And you're doing it virtually, I believe, right? Because you live in Massachusetts. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Correct. Yeah. That's so I'll tell you the, the full breakdown. So if you really want to go all the way back, uh, I knew I wanted to be in real estate um, when, since I was in second grade. So I moved houses into a new development. And um, there's like 52 houses there. And it was actually my dad after like a couple months in, he said, yeah, the person who sold this neighborhood must have made a ton of money. I was like, wait, you're right. I started doing the math. There was like $400,000, $500,000 a piece. He made like 20 something million dollars. Like that's more money than like anybody ever see. That's all I got to do is build one neighborhood. I'm like, oh my God. So like that sparked my attention when I was younger and um, always been good at math, um, but I'm also just very social too. So I real estate kind of fits into that. Those two, don't nor- those two don't normally go together, math and social. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I was like, all right, so that, that's kind of sparked it, but never really did anything. Um, so then I was working at Market Basket. I got a job when I was 14 years old, um, which is just a grocery store out near me. And then COVID came and um I quit that place. I hated it. It was awful. Um, and I was like, well, I had like, I think I went six months into COVID because it was July 2020. Um, oh yeah, it was July of 2020. I got started on entrepreneurship. Um, I actually was like, okay, I might as well start trying to find a way to make money online. Um, so I mainly heard of it through TikTok and all that sort of stuff. So it was July 2020. And before real estate, I actually did affiliate marketing for a bit. So mm. I was involved with some social media marketing for about a year or so. Um, grew an account. This about- is your, you're in what, 10th grade? Uh, freshman year. Freshman, freshman year. in high school. Yeah. Freshman yeah. in high school. Okay. Keep yeah. going. So freshman year in high school, um, started doing some social media marketing, did it for about a year, learned a lot, but grew an account to like 40,000 followers on TikTok. Eventually I got banned and it was like an epiphany moment. Like, okay, my end all be all goal was to get into that and get into real estate. Cause I just knew I eventually wanted to. I was like, why don't we just figure out how to start real estate? So it was July, 2021 by that point. And I've heard of wholesaling. I saw Kong and stuff on TikTok mm-hmm. and like, all that sort of stuff. So that sparked my interest. And I was like, you know what, let's get started. So I researched how 16 year olds can get started in wholesaling because I just heard it through social media. And I came across this kid who lived in Virginia, which is how I entered the Virginia market, even though I live in Massachusetts. And he made probably like, I don't know the exact numbers around $100,000 in like nine months, just JVing deals in the DMV area. I was like, 
wow, that is crazy. So I reached out to him eventually, um, kept asking, Hey, can I cold call for you? So I spent about two weeks on YouTube, which is kind of where I learned everything about the basics between you, Pace, Jamil, like flip with Rick, just all these YouTube channels. Then two weeks in, I was like, well, I kind of feel like I, I know all the baseline. It seems really simple. Like might as well get started. So I reached out to him um, and he eventually gave me the opportunity to cold call for him. And I closed my first deal on um, wholesale and cold calling. So that was August, mid August by the time I started cold calling. And I closed okay. the deal um, by, I think it was October 29th, the day before I even got my license. Um, we closed the deal, which is, I was pretty excited about that. Um, and I continued did you to get paid, Did you get paid a commission on that deal or how, what was your structure? Yeah, he, um, he gave us a commission. He was giving us like 10% or whatever. Um, I kind of did a lot of the work, but it was a $2,500 deal. So I made like 250 bucks. It wasn't really much, but it was the experience that got me there. Um, and I cold called for him up through January. So it was about five months. And I eventually left him. It was me and a couple other teenagers that left him because um, things, he would just didn't operate how we wanted them. So I was like, all right, I'm still in Virginia. Might as well search for buyers on Facebook. I'll just find my own thing. Cause he was signing my contracts. He was 16, but he was having another guy sign his contracts. Mm. JP me. And I was looking for buyers on Facebook and I ran to Jared Hetler, who's my partner. Um, great, great guy. I text that guy probably an hour a day. He's, he's helped me so much along this way. I can't you even couldn't, really appreciate You couldn't that. sign contracts because you're not 18 yet. Yep, correct. Was, I could have had my parents do it or whatever. Now, nobody in my, for people out there listening, I've never touched real estate. Nobody in my family knew real estate, no friends, like literally zero connections at all. So I was like, I might as well figure it out with people that have done it. So I found Jared um, and I was looking for buyers. And after calling him for like two hours, I was like, all right, um, I actually can't sign contracts. Yes, you want to sign my contracts for me? And he's like, yeah, man, 100%. Um, and that's when he was doing like one or two deals a month. And like six months later, he had like 11 deals under contract. So yeah. I caught him where he, he was just willing to help me. Um, so now Jared has been doing, I was cold calling for that other kid. And Jared, he does all agent outreach. So all of his deals, he just networks with real estate agents. And we're in the Hampton Roads, um, Virginia market and the Richmond, Virginia market. That's, right. um, that's all we do. We're pretty much connected with every single realtor. And I learned from him and because I saw it as a great opportunity because I didn't have money for marketing. I was like, I need to do free marketing. That seems like the base level entry I can work for as long as there's daylight going. I all work forever, but um, I just didn't so have you money. you switched yet. over to on market like Jared and started doing working with agents, doing yep. agent. Yeah. Yeah, okay. exactly. So networks with real estate agents. Jared was making offers and stuff and he showed me the hoops. So I just network. I met him in January 2022, and then it took me six months. I closed my first deal in July of 2022, so it was a mm-hmm. special July. And since then, um, I've done 11 deals, totaling at uh, about $92,000 at this point, um, all through agent outreach, which is just crazy. So you built the system. So, you're, so your first deal would have been while you were a junior, right, in high school? Yep. Yep. Junior yeah. going into being a senior. Yeah, in that summer. Yeah. Um, and, so and then did 11 deals basically in your senior year. You've done 11 deals as, yep. a, as a high school kid. Now, let me ask you, how did you, how did you fit that in with school? How, what was your schedule like? Yeah, great, great question. It, it was awful, short answer. <laughs> but uh, so I, school started at 7.30. I got up at seven. So I just went to school and I got out at two o'clock every day. And I was about home by 2.30, but I was time done eating lunch and stuff like that. And it was really from like three o'clock to seven every single day, um, just hitting the phones. It was a mixture of reaching out to new agents, circling back with the agents already under my belt to keep them in the loop Mm -hmm. to give me deals. And then anybody who's like, oh, I had this deal coming up. So my first task was work the deals I'm currently working to get them and then circle back with my older agents and then new agent outreach. So every day it was just about four hours, which honestly was enough. Like you really can make it because I averaged in 10 months, 91 K, which is about 10 K a month, roughly working three, four hours a day at the end of the day. Um, And now school's out. So now I can work completely full time. I'm taking a gap year uh, to do it full time. But yeah, it was, it was rough, but lots of times I was making, um, I'll tell, I'll get to this when we do the deal structure, but I was making lots of calls during school too. If I had like a free period, just lunch, just all the time, my friends are like, oh, Brian's making another call. I was like, I need to work this deal. Yeah. So it was, it was tough, but we worked it. 
How many agents do you think you talked to in that four hour block? Cause you said, you said you were circling back, which is follow up, which is critical. Yep. But uh, between maybe calling existing agents and new agents, how many do you think you were doing in, a, in every day? I was sending out a message, a call or a text. This isn't a response rate, but probably 50 messages every single day, whether it was a text or a call. Granted, it completely lacked. If like there were some days it barely cut that because my follow-ups went so long. And so while that was my goal, it was probably more realistic, like 20 agents a day conversations, which isn't even a lot. Like now I can, now that I've mastered it, like I can not even master, but just it's like rinse and repeat bread and butter. I can talk that many in like an hour, shoot that many texts. Like now now it's just, it's so easy. So, but yeah. yeah, Your your texts and and your texts are basically saying, Hey, it's Brian. We spoke last week or whatever, you know, just checking in. Do you have any deals coming up? Anything I can make an offer on? I'm all cash looking for a deal. I mean, right. Is, is that basically what your text is? Yeah, pretty much. So to go back. So Jared pretty much focused, as you know, he's, um, he's good about making five offers a day. That's what he sticks with. He likes hitting those numbers. I kind of, so during COVID last year, Jared was crushing it, making offers on the MLS. And I was making offers for so long, but this is also when I was starting out and I could never get them. So really what I saw it as is if I work long enough, I could eventually get an on-market deal. But I could work it better in a sense where my time would be worth my energy versus I tell agents, hey, we already see everything on market, but let me know when you have something coming up. So all my 11 deals have been off market through agents ever since July. It's I make offers on the on market ones, but everybody sees them. It's it's possible. Like Jared is living proof of that. But my energy is way better for the deals personally for just saying when you get. I agree with that too. So one thing I one thing I taught Jared and I tell everybody is use the brand new listing as an excuse to call on that, call that agent and make an offer, still make the offer. But now that it's on market, you're competing with everybody else who sees it. So your, your chances of getting a great deal do go down significantly because now it's public. What's more important. And this is what I tell everybody. What's more important. Isn't the offer it's, it's making the connection and building the relationship because what happens is, is at the end of that conversation, you'll say, Hey, do you got anything else I can look at? Or can you yeah. call me next time you get something that looks distressed? I'll give you my numbers and let's let's see if we can work a deal before you list it. Agents mm-hmm. love doing that. If they can do, we call that a pocket listing. If they can do a pocket listing before it goes public, everybody's happier. Sellers happier, you know, agents happier because you can get the deal done without all the drama of showings, inspections, and buyers agents and all that. Mm-hmm. So I think you're totally right. Doing the follow up and making the connections to where then those agents start calling you. Once yeah. agents start inbounding your phone, it's you're, you're now you've done it. You're, you're going to win the game because they're calling you. You're not calling them. Exactly. And I took it one step even further on that because I realized like, hey, I'm an investor. Then lots of times, like I just know being in the business that my offer is not going to get accepted, but I just use it as an excuse to talk to them. So I started doing a lot of the creative financing. I even got an internship in that um, a couple months ago um, for the last spring, uh, last quarter of high school. But since I was indulged in the creative stuff, I take it one step even further where I call on the nice homes and say, hey, would they be interested in owner financing? And they say no. So I instantly just like say, okay, we're done talking about the deal. Hey, by the way, before I go, so I'm in and out vetting my agents in two minutes. So realistically, if I was on fire, I could hit 30 agents an hour and vet them all. Um, that's what I've narrowed it down to, as opposed to let's spend 30 minutes talking about it, looking it up, make an offer that I know is going to get denied. So I, that's That's how I try to get volume too. I hope you guys caught that. Let me, let me kind of repeat what Brian just said here. This is, this is a game changer move right here that Brian's doing. So you're right. Like if I call on an existing stress property, I'm often on the phone with that agent, working the deal, looking at comps, talking about repairs, trying to, trying to position myself, make my low offer. Sometimes 15 minutes, sometimes 20, 30 minutes on that one with that one agent, knowing darn well that my chances of getting that particular deal are really slim because it's it's more than likely it's overpriced and the price I need to get it for is going to be a deep discount. Now I've gotten them, so it's not like you you still do it. But what you're saying is you're saying, no, I'd rather just talk to 30 agents an hour just so that I can get in front of them, just so that I can offer 
my services of buying cash? Do you have anything to stress? Building a connection, building out my list of agents that I can then follow up on, follow up on. And by doing that, you're just playing a numbers game now. You're talking to so many agents and then following up really well that it's only a matter of time before somebody's going to be contacting you with a deal. It's just going to happen because you're just hitting the agent outreach in volume. You're just talking to enough agents. You do anything in this business enough times consistently, and it's you're going to get deals. There's no way around it. it, you, it you're, they're just going to happen. You're going to, the stars are going to align. You're going to talk to the right agent at the right time. Who's got a motivated seller, ready to go, willing to take your low cash offer and boom, you just did a deal. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Brian, works. You know, Brian, it's interesting because you know, I talked to a lot of people about this business that sh- that are struggling. And I've never once talked to somebody who's talking to people as much as you are 20, 30 times an hour on the phone, talking to people an hour, guys. And he did this four hours after high school that produced 11 deals in nine months as a senior in high school. You Granted, know, it was more like actually talking to 15, but like 30 is possible, but yes. Okay. But still. Yeah. So, okay. So yeah. maybe, yeah, you're right. Okay. So closer to 15. The, the point though is the, my, the point I'm trying to make here though, guys, is if you're talking to that many agents, as many as Brian is hour in and hour out, right? Day in and day out, you're going to do deals. So when people aren't doing deals, I can almost always pinpoint it down to you are not having enough quality conversations. You're not talking to enough people, agents or, or sellers, you're not putting enough offers in front of people. And then, and when you can finally grasp that, that in transition into quality conversations equal deals, deals equal money, when you can bridge that and you bring that all together, then now you're going to just blow the business up. And in a year from now, Brian, now that you're doing full time, you're going to yeah. now hit a, you're going to hit a wave of momentum. And it's going to be nuts what you do in another year because you're willing to be consistent about the work. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. I've my plan. So realistically, I made a huge mistake um, going into this. So if there is honestly one of my biggest takeaways is really stay consistent. That is the key to it. Like just have blind faith, even if you don't see anything working in one day. That doesn't mean that that's not going to pay off in a year from now, six months from now, whatever. But I, because I was only working on four hours, lots of times I was so focused on just new outreach. I forgot about some of the older agents. Mm. Biggest mistake ever because now I'm going back and going through. So if I look back, I probably had a couple hundred agents under my belt that I was constantly in the network with, but I missed out on a couple hundred others. So Mm. I plan to 3X everything of the system I built up by August in the next three months because I'm working full time, build that system up and I can be on track. So I made hundred about 100K in nine months. Uh, my goals, and I'm on track to make anywhere between 100, 150, another 100, 150 by December because I'm 3Xing that. So it it really is just volume. Um, but that is definitely one of my biggest takeaways is just focus on what works. And I know I even saw this in Jerry's interview, like there's income producing activities while working only two to three hours a day, especially people if they have jobs, like that is the most important thing is making sure that our you get done what you need to. And that is the task of follow up with old agents, work current deals and follow up with new agents. I spent so much time like organizing, like, oh, I I talked about this on the phone. Like it didn't matter because a slight chance it matters, but not enough to like bring in that volume. So yeah, you want to move the needle. You're all, it's always about, you know, oftentimes we think that busy is the same as productive and it's not busy is not productive necessarily productive in this business. If it's wholesale, it's that quality conversation because we don't have any control over whether or not the agent's going to talk to a seller, which is going to get a deal or talk to a seller and they're going to say yes to our low offer. We don't we don't have any control over that, but what we do have control over is talking to 15 agents an hour and putting offers and asking them if they have deals like that, that we have control over and that's going to move the needle more than anything else in this business. You know, it's interesting, Brian, where you talked about uh, the follow-up. I had this... Uh, This is what did it for me years ago. Um, I called this agent and I made an offer on their listing, right? So listing comes out, call the agent, make the offer. They reject my offer. And then uh, like a month goes by and I see that house as a sold comp. Mm -hmm. And I look at it and I'm like, that property sold 
for uh, it sold for less than what I offered. Right. So someone paid more than someone. So my offer was higher than what it actually sold for. So I was, so I called up the agent and I said, dude, what happened? You know, I made an offer on that property and now I see that it sold for less than my offer. Why didn't you call me? I was willing to pay more than what you actually sold it for. And he goes, oh yeah, I forgot that you were interested in that property. Yeah. And so it hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, and so here I'm imagining, I'm imagining what happened here. They say no to my offer. Maybe a couple of days goes by, maybe a week goes by. Somebody else comes along and makes an offer on that property. Now that agent submits the offer or, and it gets accepted, or maybe that happened, or maybe the seller now is like, okay, I'm willing to take a lower price. And that agent's like, okay, great. Let's drop the price a little bit. The agent doesn't think to call me. He doesn't remember the conversation we had. Uh, you know, stupid on the agent's part because imagine if agents did what you're doing with them, if they did that with cash buyers and wholesalers. Oh my gosh, I could show agents how to completely blow up their business if they followed the same things we do as wholesalers, right? Mm -hmm. But they don't. They're not gonna. They're not gonna be as organized as you are, Brian. They're not gonna remember to call you. You have to assume that they're not gonna call you when they get a deal. Yep. Because they're not going to remember who you are. You talk to them every single week. Pretty soon, they're when they get a deal, they're going to go, "Oh, I've got a deal. This is great for an investor. Who should I call? Mm -hmm. I'm going to call Brian because he follows up with me every single week. I know he's looking for deals. He's the first one that comes to mind. It's front and center with agents. Whatever, yep. whoever is staying in touch with them the most is going to get the deals. And yep. I had to learn that the hard way by missing out on a, like an amazing deal. And then it clicked and I was like, okay, I've got to stay in touch with agents. I cannot rely on them to call me. I've got to be front and center. I got to be contacting them more than anybody else so that they know to call me when they get deals. And that's what you're doing. You're building and you're building this, this basically a referral network where now they're going to be contacting you with all their deals. Yep, exactly. That's how it goes. And it's it is exactly right. Even if you don't have a conversation with the person, I've had agents where I literally send them like 12 texts in a row once a month. And then a year later, hey, I have a deal. They just see it. They see it on the phone. They see your name. It's like, oh, I remember that person. But like, yeah. you don't need to be in front of you. Just really stay consistent. And I've had agents block me too. Some agents are like, oh, whatever. And you learn to like, you know, vet the agents and know their personalities. Like, okay, they're a once a month type of person. They're a once a week type of person. And you'll learn in time. But it's, yeah. So you're exactly right. <laughs> yeah. How often do you do you like to follow up with agents? Once a week? Is it more often? Less often? I stick with once every like three weeks. Honestly, okay. I, I do once every three. I'm not trying to bother them. But I'm trying to remember them. There are some like if I know agents are busy, they're once every two weeks. Uh, okay. If I know some agents are like they have a full time job, and they do a couple deals a year. They might be once a month. Like they really it it completely depends. I categorize them. I, it's in my Excel sheet. Just. I put one week, two weeks, three, four weeks, depending on just their personality. Um, but yeah, so it depends. Now, what's yeah. awesome is um, yesterday from this recording, you and Jared did a deal in uh, Virginia Beach, a townhouse. Yep. Um, I I double I funded it for you guys. I did the uh, transactional funding, double closing. You guys did a double closing, netted like thirty two thousand and some change. And uh, I was looking at your HUD statement on the second closing. So the, or no, 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 it would have been, it would have been the first closing, the AB transaction. Mm -hmm. And on the seller side, it had listed buyer's agent commission or seller listing agent commission, 4,200. Buyer's agent commission, 4,200. Total commission, 8,400. One agent made $8,400 in commission that brought you guys the deal, right? Mm -hmm. And the seller paid 100% of the commission for an agent to be motivated to bring you a deal that doesn't cost you any money in marketing that you guys make $32,000. Is there anything more glorious and wonderful than that right there? Oh, not at all. Not to mention he's, he's, he's already said he's looking at more for this month. So oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's that it's, agent made $8,400 yeah. on a $140,000 listing. That's insane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. It's nuts. And even too, lots of times too, agents, not only will they take double dip, but almost always they even take like 4% because they take 4% and they're helping the seller to even pay less and take two. That's 
almost always because they they really care about their clients as they should. Um, yeah. It's one hundred percent. But yeah, it's completely powerful. Just the power of networking. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's amazing. That's great. So of the eleven deals you've done so far, uh, let's maybe let's run through one of them and just kind of give us the kind of the the A to Z how the deal went down. Which one of those has been like your favorite deal so far? Should I do two? I did two. Uh, I, you'll you'll understand why. One is like one exactly with one you were saying yesterday. It was definitely my favorite one because it was the biggest, and the fact um, that I felt as though there everybody got everybody won the most in that deal. That was one of the deals where like the seller inherited the home from their uh, mom who just passed away. They needed it gone. We came. They wanted it at like 160, 165. Um, and the agent originally told me ARV was like 220. I was like, okay, that's nice. So here's, listen to this. I was like, the numbers aren't there. And he knows I do owner financing. I was like, would they be interested in owner financing? He said, no, they wouldn't. And they's like, would you be interested in a cash offer a couple of days later? He comes back. And then I didn't have the address yet. Cause he just told me it was like near ARV. And then he gives me it. It's worth 270. I'm like, I was like, there's a hundred case. I was like, Absolutely. And then my buyer, he went to go see it. He was in at 175. So this I is the, threw that's the deal I funded. You're talking the uh yeah. the townhouse. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Exactly. 100 percent What's crazy is um, so the listing was for 140, right? It was, yeah. We got it for 140. They wanted 160, 165. We threw out 140 and they didn't even counter. They just said we'll and take so it. that was a pocket listing, then, right? It must have been. Okay. Correct. Because if you look at it right now. They when they so they must have just listed it so that they could get sometimes you have to, even if you do a pocket listing, they have to still list it. So it's yeah. interesting because it was listed and sold for 140. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it doesn't even look like it doesn't even look like a deal to anyone else. It looks like you paid full price. Yep. Exactly. Which, which happens. I mean, sometimes they'll list it low enough to where full price is still a deal. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is um it's kind of like not even disclosed because you guys already had the deal done before it got even got listed. Yeah, it was listed pending. You beat out all the competition in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's correct. It's crazy. Yeah. Now, yeah, the other deal, this one you're you're gonna like. This is the craziest thing ever. So, it was an agent brought it to me. It was an off market one, and they said uh, they're asking seventy five thousand dollars. And I pitched it to my buyer and he said, I told him 85, probably around 80, 85. He said, flat out, no, not going to work. And my buyer buys pretty high. So I was like, okay, if it's not going to work, kind of whatever. And this was one week. I remember very, very vividly. I was so busy that I didn't even have time to tell the agent no or yes, or say anything. I literally just said, well, look at the deal. And I didn't, I didn't talk about it for like a week. So my buyer comes back and says a week later, Hey man, I need more deals. I might be interested in that one you were talking about. And good thing I didn't say no, which was interesting. <laughs> I didn't say no or yes. I let it sit. Um, and then I was like, okay, I told the agent I was, that we had pictures and stuff. I was like, okay, we'll, uh, we'll do $60,000. So they accept. I was like, no counter. I was like, oh my agent 60. Yep. I told the agent six and he was in at 70. So he said after looking at it, he's like, nah, it's more realistically like 70. So and your first and your your initial offer with that agent was how much? 75? Uh she was saying that we could oh, get it at 75. Okay. Well, then it's, it's, sat, it's sat cold. Then your buyer changes his mind and comes back and says, I'll I can do it for what'd you say, 80 or 85? Yeah, for 70. He oh, thought 70. 80, 85, okay. and he went in at 70. So I just pitched 60. Okay, so, then you're back at 60. Gotcha. Yep. And we were we had it locked up, we were good, everything was straight. So interesting story. You'll see how this plays in. So the seller was in prison. Right. And the agent, this she, the agent got it through another agent. So it's also people in their office too. When you reach out to an agent, it's like, who do they also know? So they, she didn't know that she knew the seller was in prison. Um, you'll find out why in a second. So we got it locked up. My buyer's like, okay, we'll go and see the place. So he went down to go and visit the home. And when he went, um, he said that we were responsible for turning on the utilities for the property. So we had to call the city and say, Hey, can you turn on the utilities? Which was interesting. We we're like, okay, we'll we'll be fine doing that. And that sparked something because when my buyer went there, they were boarding up the house. He said, "What are you doing? I, I'm I'm buying this property." I was like, "No, you're not." Like after you called us, we dug into the home. It's like this is the biggest fentanyl bust in Virginia ever. And I was like, "Oh, 
nobody knew. The agent didn't know. My buyer didn't know. They're like, if you go in there, you'll die. Like they literally told me, like, you can't go in there. It's so toxic. Like it's a hazard. Like they were boarding it up, shutting it down. I was like, what? It was, it was crazy. So then we went back to the agent. She didn't know. And we were like, yeah, uh, 60 is not going to work. My buyer said, okay, I'll do a new construction. It was a really low income um, home area. So he's like, oh, I can be in around 50 ish. I was like, you know what? I'm going to leverage the fact that this is something so big that I'm going to throw 30. So I threw out 30 and she said, I also learned a lesson from this because she said, no, that's not going to happen. We only accepted your initial 60 because you were the first offer. So we already have higher offers than 60 right now. I said, do they know about the fentanyl bus? She said, no, they don't. And I was like, <laughs> okay, so that makes sense. But which by the I way, honestly, they, they, that agent would have to disclose that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 100%. So I could have sat there, but this is at a point in my business where like, I, I get a deal like once every month at that point, I was like, no deal or a huge deal. I was like, uh, I was like, I'll oh, come up. I, I, so this is a lesson um, where I'm 99% positive. That could have been a 20 something K deal. Um, and just to throw back this too, my two first deals, because I stuck my ground, my two very first deals ever, I dropped each seller a hundred thousand dollars, which is crazy. Just because I said, I'm not moving. Um, I should have done this up on this one. Cause I'm curious what would have happened, but we got it at 48. My buyer bought it at 52 and he's going to tear it down. But yeah, that was, that was a crazy, crazy deal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really interesting that, that concept there. So, you know, what I found is when you hold out for a bigger fee, obviously you're going to lose out on some deals, but the trade-off on the deals that you still get is going to is going to quadruple your income and you'll find that you'll still get the majority of your deals if you just hold firm on your price. What happens is is we get a little bit of scarcity, we get a little scared. We think, you know what, I bet I it better to make 5 grand than maybe lose the deal. When the reality is, if you just would hold your ground, you might, there's a high chance you'll still get the deal. And then you could have made 20 instead of five, right? Yep, yep, and that exactly. just takes, it takes having a little bit of confidence and it takes a real abundant mindset because you have to be thinking, if you're thinking, I might not get another deal, then you're going to take the five. You're going to be scared and you're going to come up. But if you think that you deserve, that there's more deals, that a 20K deal is what you should get, then all of a sudden you start doing bigger deals and you start holding your ground. I had a deal one time where like we were off by like a thousand bucks between me and the seller. And I told the agent, I said, nope, not coming up. And the agent said to me, you're going to lose this deal over a thousand bucks. And I said, the seller's willing to let this deal go over a thousand bucks. Like, you know, I got the same <laughs> argument right back at you. Yep. And then I sat and it just waited Two, three days later, I get a call. They'll take your offer. Now that was only a thousand bucks, but my point is like, hold on, hold firm on what you believe is a good deal. Show up in the business with this abundant mindset. There are always more deals. There's another, I have this belief that there's another deal waiting for me right around the corner. Yep. And the next call is going to be that home run deal. Like I think that way. And so then all of a sudden I just keep getting like amazing deals and it's, it's not about the list or this or that. It's about the mindset more than anything. This is the question though, you know, let's, we'll wrap up our, our interview here, Brian, but here, this is the thing that I've been dying to find out. And I hope, I mean, maybe you can convey this in some way. Why are you so driven to do this business? What, what's got you motivated as a high schooler to come home and get on the phones for four hours? I don't know very many people willing to do that at, at, in high school. I just don't yeah. know. Where I, I've always sorry? been a very, a very disciplined person my whole life. Um, I mean, I was, I was always doing good in school 100%, but it was, I honestly can't even quite answer my question. Like everybody's like, find your why. I truly don't even have my why. There was something inside that was just a spark. And I knew that I just, I just don't want to be like everybody else. And it's just like, well, if if I'm doing the same things as everybody else, I'm going to end up in the same results. And it's just knowing that it's kind of just like in the back, you're like, well, if you don't do this, then you're, then you're just going to be in the same place. And it's almost just that it's just, I just have a passion for self-improvement. I just, it's just deep inside me. or almost like it, it's, it's a lit flame. That's, that's not going out. So why, why though? <laughs> 
I mean, what, what, what was like your dad an alcoholic or like, you know, were, were you were you homeless when you were a kid? Did, I, I don't uh, know. I mean, <laughs> my mom passed away a couple of years ago. That did that did happen. So that was also part of it. I mean, she she was always like, you're going to do great things at the end of the day. So like that was a part of it. But like it's a combination of just okay. self-improvement. Okay. We'll want to be better than ever. But yeah, I don't have that one one thing. It's just kind okay. of everything combined. That's just lights me up. <laughs> well, sorry to hear that about your mom. That's, that's tough. That's hard. Yeah. It's, it's okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. But yeah, that's hard, but yeah. good for you, Brian, on, you know, creating the life of your dreams because, you know, you're on a trajectory right now where, you know, wholesaling may not be your end game. You know, it could be, but you may transition. I, I imagine you'll transition into other things as you go through your journey. I mean, you're so young, you got your whole life ahead of you. But this, this I will say, and this I know, that if you just keep doing what you're doing, whatever you end up, whatever path you go down, if you just stay consistent, put in the work, you're going to be ultra successful because most of this business is just showing up every day. Like just show up, put in the call, do the dials, and you'll 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 win at this business. Yeah, you know, like it's right. not rocket science. You don't really need to be that smart. You just need to be driven. Is all. Yeah, it's just that. Yeah, that's all. Is just a mental battle every single day. It's really just. It's so easy now to say, "Hey, do you have any deals?" No. Okay. Goodbye. This is, it's it's, it's so e easy. It's so easy that it's actually hard. Yep. <laughs> In fact, it's so easy that everyone overcomplicates it because you you tell yourself it can't be this easy. It, it really can't. There's got to be way more to it. No. No. Actually, there's yeah. not that much to it. You You're get right. it at a discount. You find someone who wants it. You sign a piece of paper, and they give you thirty two thousand dollars. Yep. You got it. That's the formula right there. You know what I mean? Like, why are we, it's not really that complicated. What's, what's complicated is talking to 15 agents an hour for hours on end. That's, yeah. that's, because <laughs> it's, it's, like, cool. it's, it's monotonous. It's boring. It's brutal. It's rejection. It's, it's, you know, it's the same thing again. That's where people just can't seem to get their head around it. Yeah. You know? So the discipline you have at your age to do that, I mean, you're going to be ultra successful in your life just by the sheer willingness to stay committed to one thing for a period of time. Just that alone. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Great advice. Great tips. Really fun doing this interview with you guys. Leave a yeah. comment and say, Brian, you are a flipping genius. Truly <laughs> and truly inspirational <laughs> guys. I'm also going to put in the link because by the time you watch this, it'll have happened. But uh, Brian and, and two other teams, we did a, we did a lot a four hour live um, you know, just going through the mechanics of wholesaling, looking at leads, running numbers, getting on the phones. So I'll put that link below too. And a lot of fun. And thank you, Brian, again, for all you do for being an inspiration. And really, yeah. honestly, um, I mean, I think, I think if teens can watch this and see you, you know, as a teen, you tend to think this is for adults. And maybe when I'm, when I'm grown up or, you know, after, <laughs> after I graduate, maybe, or after I see all the time teens that are like, man, once I turn 18, once I turn 18, no, you don't got to wait till you're 18. Yeah. <laughs> Find someone that'll sign your contracts for you and you yep. can do this. You exactly. Know? So you're, you're inspiring that way. Thank you so much for, for being that inspiration. I, I mean it, like you don't realize how big of an inspiration this is for, for young people and, and people yeah. who anybody really, but especially young people to really make something out of their life, even as a teenager. Yep. I completely yeah. agree. And I appreciate it. I, I, I mean, I learned the same way. I saw a teenager and it, it sparked me. That's all, that's all that happened to me. So hopefully that'll help everybody. And even adults just, just make a change in our life for the better. So really grateful awesome. for everything and appreciate it, Jerry. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Brian.